Good morning, God's beloved. Welcome to the United, the Kent United Church of Christ, an open and affirming and accessible to all congregation. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are certainly welcome here. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. In God we take refuge. God hears us and, and saves us. God is our rock and our fortress. God is our hope. And so we come seeking God's peace. We come offering God's grace. We, we gather, gather together, together in worship. worship. Please join me in the invocation. Almighty God, as humans, Christians, spiritual beings, people of recovery, help us realize that we are all becoming who you would have us be. It is a process of progress, not perfection. Open our hearts and minds to your will for us. Open our hearts and minds to each other that through this community of faith, your love will be perfected through Jesus Christ our Lord. May the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please share the peace of Christ with each other. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. A reading from the gospel. This is the story of the prodigal son. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Here ends the reading from God's word. Thanks be to God, who is still speaking. So, have you ever been lost? Not physically lost, but spiritually lost. Have you ever felt yourself drifting away from God? Have you ever felt empty? In Luke 15, Jesus tells of a son who demands his inheritance up front. He craves another life. He craves excitement. His current life is not enough. So he leaves home with his inheritance, loses it all to wild living. He is reduced to a subhuman existence. But he finally comes to his senses and says to himself, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. So the son repents and begs his father to make him a servant. But the father cries out in joy, for his lost son has returned. He calls for a celebration to mark his return. The father is full of mercy and forgiveness. In Romans 3.23, Paul states, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 tells us that God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. 
It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Dr. Nicole Labor is a recovering addict and an addiction medicine specialist at Summa Health in Akron. In her lecture, The Neurobiology of Addiction, Dr. Labor describes the addicted mind as craving out of control. She goes on to say that spirituality may be one of the most powerful tools for recovery from any addiction. The frontal cortex in our brains is responsible for conscious thought and behavior control, including love, morality, responsibility, and spirituality. The midbrain is responsible for survival and has only three functions, eat and drink, kill, and procreate. When a baby is born, it must immediately be fed. The goal is to make the baby crave food, leading to an addiction to food. Without becoming addicted to food, the baby will die. Drug addiction is a brain disease where the midbrain craves more and more drug to find any pleasure in life, regardless of the consequences. Such an active midbrain quickly overpowers the frontal cortex and its ability to control our choices and behaviors. In her book, Never Enough, Judith Grissel describes the genesis of her own addiction. Alcohol provided powerful subconscious recognition of my desperate strivings for self-acceptance and existential purpose and my inability to negotiate a complex world of relationships, fears, and hopes. She goes on to say, rather than provide a solution to my problems with living, alcohol and other drugs chipped away at every prospect until only the barest shred of life remained. She sought wellness and became sick. Fun, but lived in a constant state of anxious dread. Freedom, and was enslaved. Eventually, two factors motivated her desire to recover. First, she began to wonder what it would be like to live in the relatively uncharted territory of sobriety. It was equal parts courage and curiosity that contributed to her decision to give abstinence a try. Her second motivation was the decision to find a cure. You see, Judith Grissel was a daily drug user and college dropout when she began to consider that her addiction might have a cure that she herself could perhaps discover by studying the brain. Dr. Gazelle is now an internationally recognized behavioral neuroscientist and professor of psychology at Bucknell University. She describes the role of the neurotransmitter dopamine in our midbrain. Initially, exposure to any addictive substance or activity causes dopamine levels to spike, giving us immense pleasure and a craving for more. Eventually, exposure results in virtually no change in dopamine levels, but withholding the addictive stimulus leads to a big drop, which we experience as a feeling of disappointment and craving. The Grateful Dead argued that too much of everything is just enough. But for the addict, too much is still not enough. Dr. Grizel cites three primary reasons why people developed addictions. An inherited biological disposition, which by the way is only a minor uh, factor. Copious drug exposure, especially during adolescence when the brain is still developing. And a catalyzing environment. She argues that no one is to blame no one is to blame for the epidemic of addiction, but we all, we all are responsible. We support the tools of addiction, including pathological individualism that leads to alienation, widespread and enthusiastic endorsement of avoidance, and a smorgasbord of consumptive excess and self-medication. Another source of this epidemic is the unwillingness and inability to bear our own spiritual and emotional pain, along with our failure to look upon the suffering of others with compassion. We affect each other, including each other's neurobiology, neurochemistry, and behavior in ways that are direct, 
and profound. Dr. Gazelle concludes with these words, while we are at it, instead of wringing our hands, we might try reaching out for another's. Addicts must develop coping skills for recovery. Spirituality is the only coping skill capable of providing the frontal cortex with the power to overcome an active midbrain. Spirituality is the general term for a worldview that places an emphasis on interconnection and the presence of larger forces beyond the realm of the individual human being. This worldview differs from a strictly religious orientation, which seeks to describe reality in terms of a specific set of organized beliefs. Being spiritual has nothing to do with your religion or what you believe and everything to do with your state of consciousness. False spiritual states of consciousness include addictions to drugs and alcohol, but also gambling, sex, power, money, stuff, closets, and storage units <laughs> to hold all of our stuff. Also, youth, appearance, and money. Notice how much larger grocery stores are now compared to when you were a child and how much other stuff they sell. In fact, stores like Amazon are much too big to be contained in physical walls. Contrast this with the true spiritual states of consciousness, including love, peace, joy, unity, connection, creativity, and service. Notice there's a turning outward in all of those. The false states of consciousness arise when we turn inward, while true states reflect a turning outward toward God and toward others. Human history is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God to make him happy. Our human nature drives us to crave spiritum, or addictions, instead of spiritus, or God. We are a people seemingly hardwired to not be satisfied with what we have. What we have is never enough. In the parable of the rich fool from Luke 12 verses 15 through 21, Jesus shares with the crowd, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barn and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. So how do we as Christians deal with cravings in our lives and in the lives of those around us? We can declare a war, a war on drugs. However, many argue that the war on drugs has been and continues to be an abject failure. As we have learned, The addicted mind is not rational. The addicted mind loses the ability to make rational choices and will do anything to feed the addiction. No real or perceived threat, including incarceration or worse, will deter the addict. We can ignore those with addiction like we ignore so many other problems in our society. But remember that as Christians, our spirituality demands that we turn toward others with love, unity, connection, 
and service. Writing in the Union Gospel Mission Impact blog, Barbara Camito argues that as Christians, we need to accept five truths about addiction. Number one, the addict is a glorious human being. We were created in the image of God. We are created to be beautiful and glorious, reflecting the nature of the one who made us. And yet the image of God in humans has been shrouded, distorted, <clears throat> and nearly expunged by sin. Which brings us to the next point. We're all in the same boat. Paul painted us all with the same brush when he wrote, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Earlier in the same chapter, Paul quotes Psalm 14 when he writes, There is no one righteous, not one. We cannot condemn any other person, including those struggling with addiction, without condemning ourselves. We may not have ever used illegal drugs. We may not struggle with an overt addiction. But by nature of being human, we have fallen short. We have all broken the command Jesus said was paramount to love God with all our heart and all our soul and all our strength. We have loved pleasure or success or approval more than we have loved God. We have broken the second great command to love our neighbor as ourself. We have envied and compared and gossiped and taken the best bit for ourselves. As a society, we suffer from all sorts of addictions. We're all doing things to make us feel better, to give us self-worth, things that take the place of God in our lives. Third, pain generally underlies addiction. Addiction isn't the problem because sobriety alone won't lead to a fulfilled life. The underlying causes, the emotional and spiritual pain that addiction was meant to cover up must be addressed. Addiction often starts as a means of feeling normal. The addict thinks if he drinks or shoots up, then he's not going to feel and he's not going to think. But the more you take, the bigger problem you're creating. Fourth, untreated addiction destroys lives, families, and communities. Damage people, damage other people. Don't imagine a circle that would be too neat, too clean. Imagine something messier, like a wobbly, out-of-control spiral that circles in on itself again and again. Drug addiction isn't a victimless crime. The first, vic the first user, the user is the first victim. Those closest to the addict are next, and when those victims are children, the resulting pain can cut so deeply that it permanently disfigures. And finally, the hopeless addict isn't actually hopeless. This may be the most critical point for Christians to remember. No one is ever beyond God's reach. No one is ever beyond God's reach. Jesus himself promises nothing is impossible with God. Without God's grace, all of us would be without hope. In Ephesians 2, Paul writes that we were dead. Christ brought us back to life. God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead, because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. The miracle isn't that an addict can be saved. The miracle is that any of us can be saved. In fact, addicts, because they have come to the end of themselves, are often quicker to realize the futility of life without God. Persons suffering from addiction are no different from others who suffer. They need help. They need God's help. They need our help. In a sermon from last November, I take notes. In a sermon from last November, Pastor Amy said, when we need it most, God shows up in people of faith. Our world is full of suffering our world is seeking answers. God is the answer. We are the answer. And as spiritual beings, we are all love. 
In the immortal words of John Lennon, all you need is love. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, hear us as we share our joys and concerns aloud or in our hearts. Valerie and Brian in this time of loss. God, give us grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed, courage to change the things which should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. We pray all this in the name, in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together saying, Our healer who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trust as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. May the grace and love of God enter you and your soul, and save you. When others need God in their lives, may we as people of faith feel their pain and share God's forgiveness and love and grace with them. Amen.